My presentation is entitled Cash Cow, Transitional Economies in Late Prehistoric and Early Medieval Ireland. So by examining periods of transition, we can understand the role that cultural interaction plays in, in the changes characteristic of these periods. In this session, we're examining what we're calling the hybridity threshold, or the amount of contact that is necessary to create uh, hybrid objects and cultures. Economic forces, such as trade and tribute, have long been considered key avenues of cultural contact. Yet how might these forces then also be affected by the same instances of contact? I argue that for economic change, contact must meet three important criteria. Exchange must open niche markets. There must be consistent exchange and the exchange must create a shared system of values. Exchanges that do not meet this criteria may certainly affect cultural change. However, that change may not, in turn, affect economic change. This paper will explore the ways in which culture contact and trade may change the economy itself. To understand the role that economic change uh, in economic change, I'll examine late Iron Age and to early medieval transition in Ireland in the first few centuries AD. While there's still debate concerning the nature of Iron Age economy, texts and archaeological evidence of the early medieval period, however, paint a much more vivid picture. Ireland of the early medieval period is characterized as having a daring economy, or one in which the social and political negotiations are mediated through cattle and dairy products. For instance, the personal value of individuals was defined in terms of cows and butter. The honor price for a member of the O'Care, a class of free farmers, was one and a half milk cows. The honor price for a member of the Boer, a higher class of free farmers, was three milk cows. Additionally, O'Care farmers were required to provide a pat of butter one fist width wide and two fist width, fist widths long in annual taxes. And the Boer are required to pay one milk cow. Bernard Wales and Finbar McCormick have both suggested that the daring economy in Ireland was the result of contact with Roman Britain. In this paper, I will look at economies that have demonstrated change through con cultural contact and then examine the material and immaterial evidence for Irish-Roman interaction to assess if the evidence of contact likely led to economic change during this transitional period. By characterizing the cultural intimacy necessary for economic change, then we can better, we can better define the hybridity threshold. So Graeber in 2011 explained how economies are constructed by social negotiations such as gift exchanges, in which status is conferred, is conferred through the act of giving and produces and reproduces systems of reciprocity and debt. While Graeber offers a review of pre-modern economies, these principles also underline current economic forces as we participate in multiple economies, both market and non-market, such as gift economies. Pre-modern economies, therefore, must also be considered with both formalist and substantivist uh, interpretations uh, in that they react to both traditional economic forces of supply and demand, growth and development, and are deeply socially embedded and shaped by and shape social negotiations. Formalist interpretations of economic exchange emphasizes the role that new niche markets play in shifting economic strategies. As new markets open, individuals may capitalize upon these new opportunities to increase their social status. Likewise, a substantivist interpretation understands that, that exchanges in goods also facilitates exchanges in both material and immaterial marks of society. By considering pre-modern economies to be both formalist and substantivist, we can demonstrate how culture contact may shape cultural change. Individuals exchange culturally specific preferences and tastes, motifs, designs, 
styles, as well as languages, beliefs, and understandings of value. By considering both aspects of economies, we can understand the interplay between traditional economic forces and cultural constructions. For example, Demarest in 2014 demonstrated through theories of virtual economies how cultural events, such as ritual and ceremony, can create economic demand and shape agricultural economies. Additionally, social construction of value and economic exchange can be more visible archaeologically as the circulation and adoption of coins or loanword evidence indicates specific economic interactions. In order for economic relationships to be effective, both participants in the exchange must agree on the value of a good or service. Desire for an object drives systems of exchange, yet in order to complete the transaction, both parties must agree upon a standard of value. Substantivist interpretations on economies and exchange theory suggest that because of the social nature of exchange, in every interaction, value is mutually constructed by the participants and is shaped by their personal worldviews. Consistent interactions in which value is negotiated, therefore, may mutually change perceptions of value in economic exchange. Economic change from culture contact has been observed in other places and periods, such as was the case with Roman Britain. Alberella in 2007 discussed change in economic strategies from the late Iron Age through the Roman period. Prior to Roman invasion, sheep were the dominant livestock choice in Britain. After Romans arrived, however, cattle were the dominant livestock choice. Additionally, in 2008, Alberella identified improvements to livestock husbandry from the Roman period occupation in Elm Farm in Essex suggesting that larger individuals were introduced to the herd in order to meet demands for meat. Largely, cattle represented at British sites were slaughtered in adulthood, suggesting that they were used for meat and or traction. Traction also offering the additional benefit of facilitating increased agricultural production in cereal grains. CETA in 2005 also suggests that, from butchery practice evidence at urban Romano-British sites, both quantity increases and opera operational change for butchery suggest that the cattle were favored for their meat value. Importantly, what Alborella and CETA both suggest is that these economic changes, driven by Roman interaction, also usher in socio-political changes. Alborella suggests that the lack of significant change preceding Roman invasion may have been an act of resistance against the wave of Roman cultural influences. Afterwards, however, the pressure to meet certain economic demands of the Roman administrative organization may have spurned change. And Sita also explains how changes in butchery practice similarly changes individuals' relationship with animals and the process. The eventual shift in economic strategies was unlikely a matter of submission to Roman influence, but a means of addressing new market demands in, cha in a changing political and social landscape. So let us now consider the archaeological evidence for contact between Ireland and Roman Britain. For years, Roman material has been known from, I from Irish archaeological contexts and therefore, contact with Roman Britain must certainly have occurred. Among the well-known materials, Roman goods were deposited near the entrance at Newgrange. Uh, there were two, oh sorry, let me go back. There are two sizable coin hoards consisting of second century silver from Northern Ireland. An oculus stamp, featured here, was found in County Tipperary. Pottery and materials were found at Freestone Hill. Pack silver and ingots from the Billine and Coleraine hordes, and burials at Stonyford and Lambay Island. What's more, penannular brooches, which become quite elaborate in the early medieval period, were based on provincial Roman military types. And additionally, Fiona Gavin and Connor Newman in 2007 have suggested that there is evidence for Roman military influence in 7th century silver handpins. 
Elite trade, military, and ritual interaction is therefore suggested by this evidence. Bland in 2012 has suggested that the material depos deposited at Newgrange represents social negotiations between Romans and native Irish elites, including two gold Constantine coin pendants featured there. Silver from the Baleen hoard deposited in the fourth century AD in County Limerick has been interpreted as evidence for Irish raiders or traders interacting with communities in Western Britain or payments to Irish elites for military support. A similar hoard in Coleraine, County Derry, from about the early 5th century AD, has also been suggested to have been payments to local elites from the Roman military. Additionally, the influence of Roman military style and silver ornaments may also represent military interactions. In, in Ireland, there are also several sites that suggest Roman or Romano-British individuals participating in ritual practices. For instance, the occupation at Freestone Hill has been interpreted as a Roman temple site. This suggests that ritual practices here may have occurred over a period of time. Similarly, the burials at Lambay Island and Stonyford, both from about the first century AD, indicate that those who identified as Romans themselves came to Ireland. The Lambay Island burials consist of full, extended inhumations with accompanying Romano-British grave goods, and the Sandyford or Stonyford burials consist of a cremation interred with a Roman glass perfume bottle and polished bronze lid. Neither of these burials represent native Irish traditions during the Iron Age. Therefore, not only were the materials Roman, but the practices were also Roman, suggesting that there were several individuals available who actively practiced Roman traditions and were able to carry out the funerary ceremonies in a Roman style. In addition to archaeological evidence, literary and loanword evidence suggest a degree of direct economic and political interaction between Ireland and the Roman Empire. In Ptolemy's 2nd century AD Geographia, he describes the coastline of what was then known as Iwernia and named several of the rivers and settlements. Additionally, Tacitus mentions how Romans knew Ireland's harbors and trade, or through trade. Tacitus also recounted how an ousted Irish elite sought refuge with Agricola and how Agricola acclaim, claimed that a single legion with a few auxiliaries could conquer and occupy Ireland. Finally, the early medieval laws describe sets as a denomination of silver. Fergus Kelly in 2016 suggests that the word set comes from the Latin meaning ounce indicating a certain kind of ec economic interaction. While this discussion of the evidence from, for Roman and foreign materials in Ireland uh, during the Iron Age is by no means extensive, it's uh, illustrative. As the late Iron Age Roman Ireland project has demonstrated, many more Roman materials are known from Ireland, including pottery, household goods, toilet implements, and single coin finds. So let's now consider economic interaction scenarios between Ireland and Roman Britain that could facilitate development of a daring economy. Considering the archeological evidence in a simple direct interaction, Ireland would seek luxury goods from the Roman Empire and Roman Britain would seek dairy products from Ireland. Additionally, Ireland would require salt from Roman Britain in order to preserve dairy products such as butter and cheese to facilitate trade. Evidence in support of this scenario includes elite Roman goods in Ireland and the high value of cattle during the later period, resulting fr from increased demand for dairy products. There's documented evidence for dairy cattle produced in Britain from the Neolithic period onwards. Perhaps with the arrival of Romans, the native Britons and native Britain increase in meat production to fit the new economic niche, dairy products would have had to be imported from Ireland to meet needs to meet needs not met by local production. The scenario assumes that there was that there was sufficient demand to predicate increased import in dairy products. However, dairy production did not cease in Britain with the arrival of the Romans. For instance, cheese presses have been found at Longthorpe and Holt in the first century AD 
and at Colchester in the second century AD. Now let us consider a different model in which development of the daring economy in Ireland could have resulted from domestic developments that began in the Iron Age and were fully developed during the early medieval period. Ritual developments during the late Iron Age could have both represented increased importance in dairy cattle during this period, as well as necessitated increased production in cattle to meet ceremonial and social needs. At the late Iron Age ceremonial center of Donalania, there was found a high proportion of cattle re remains, particularly juveniles. Finbar McCormick and Pam Crabtree debated that this might indicate the occurrence of a daring economy in Ireland during this period, but rather concluded that the remains were the result of ceremonial feasting events. During this time as well, Synod in 2014 demonstrated that there was an increased incidence of butter deposition in bogs. Whether these dep depositions were votive or preservative, the point remains that they in indicate an increased deposition during this period and increased concern for butter preservation. Perhaps the evidence for increased feasting and deposition of butter represents domestic changes in, and economic concern for cattle and dairy and the development of the dairy economy. So Alberella in 2007 suggested that the catalyst for economic change in Britain was the Roman invasion. In Britain, Roman occupation opened niche markets through increased demand for meat. Change, exchange was consistent and created a shared system of value through shared changes in production and consumption. In Ireland, however, though exchange is evident, it may not have created the shared system of values uh, or a niche dairy market. As we've seen, Roman material in Ireland is largely high status, suggesting elite interactions or military interactions, and cheese also continued to be produced in Britain. So alternatively, Cahill in 2017 suggested that contact with Roman Britain may have instead encouraged increase in cereal grains, particularly spelt, which has been suggested by both cereal remains and increased incidences of cairnstones at horizontal mills. In this way, an economic hybridity threshold was met in Roman Britain in a way it may not have been met in Irish dairy markets, but perhaps was met in a cereal market. Thank you.